Christian Church. We're glad that you're here. Come on, let's go ahead and stand to our feet and let's worship together.
by guest services right outside the wall. Stop by there after service and say, hey, I'm new here. We want to give you a gift just to say thank you so much for taking an hour out of your weekend to see what God is doing at Motion Church. Yeah. It means the world. Hey, and Nolan, we got these really cool things. We have Motion Church masks. Yeah, 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 What's yeah. up? <laughs> hey, we have to wear masks everywhere nowadays anyways. Yeah, have to. So might as well rep Motion Church. And what a cool way to invite. You wear this at work. You wear it at the grocery store. Hopefully you're being kind to people when you wear yes. it. And you tell them, hey, come <laughs> check out my church with me. And so just another way to invite people. These are on sale for $10. And we yeah. have... We have one like this, and then we have one with a smiley face, so it shows, but just make sure if you have the smiley face one, you don't put it upside down, because it looks like you're sad. I've done that before, <laughs> and I look like a dork. So, hey, if you're wearing the Motion Church mask, like she said, be very kind, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's rep our church for Jesus. And so, guys, we have, we have three ways to give right now, and thank you guys so much for your faithful giving. It allows us to do what we're doing, and it allows us to continue to move forward with all that God has for our church. So the three ways to give, one, you can kind of do it the old school way, fill out the uh, envelope at the end of service outside back in the lobby. Go online, motionchurch.org forward slash give. You can set up recurring giving there. Kind of set it and forget it. It's an easy way to be faithful with tithes and offerings. Or you can go online or go and text any number or any amount to the number on the screen and give that way. But once again, thank you guys for giving. That's just one way that we worship God. Yeah, another way, Nolan, my favorite, and I hope we never take this for granted again, is that we get to corporately come together yeah. and lift up the name of Jesus. So we're going to yeah. take just the next few minutes and as a church, we're going to do that. So go ahead and stand to your feet. Come on, let's worship together.
we take the next few minutes and we fix our eyes on you. We walked in here carrying things that you know about only you. But God, this morning, we just want to take the next few moments and make it all about you. Thank you, Jesus. I'm caught up in your presence And I just want to sit here at your feet caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sing another song. Take me back to where we started. And I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry. When I come with my agenda, I'm sorry. When I forgot that you're enough, take me back to where we started. And I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your prayer. want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. I like this part. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. And Jesus, you don't owe
Church, that's, that's the approach we got to take when we come to God. You know, as, as followers of Christ, are, are there benefits, are there perks of being a follower of Jesus? Oh my gosh, yes. The blessings of God, the promises of God, the guaranteed hope of heaven for eternity. But we don't come to God for all of that stuff. We come to God because of his goodness. We come to God because of his love. I don't know what you came in today struggling with, facing, dealing. Maybe it's been the greatest week of your life. Maybe it's been one of the toughest and most trying weeks of your your life. But what I do know is this, that we serve a powerful God that loves us, that loves us in spite of our mistakes, in spite of our struggles, and God's there with us. And so I just want to pray for us today, and I, I want us to put God in his proper place, at the highest, at the most important God, you are the most significant thing in our life. You're the most important, God, not our career. God, not our stuff. God, not our relationships. God, you are all that we truly need. You are all that we truly want. God, I pray that we would come to you, God, wanting to receive all that you have, all of your love, all of your grace, all of your mercy, Father. And God, we would just rest in the presence of you, knowing that you're with us, that you love us, that you care for us, that you're concerned. Father, we, we love you. And we thank you for loving us. We just want you. Nothing else really matters. God, be with your people today. God, if, if there are those that are struggling, God, I pray that you would uplift their spirits. God, that you would turn their, their spirit around, turn their, their, their attitude around. And God, I pray that they would lift, lift their eyes up to you. And God, realize that there is hope because there's hope in you as followers of Christ. God, we worship you. We put you at the number one spot in our life where you belong, where you deserve to be. We thank you for it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen, amen. Can we give God a hand of praise in this place? God is so good, so worthy of our praise. Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us. You guys may be seated. Welcome to Motion Church. It is so great to see all of you guys in the house today. Hey, if you're joining us online, welcome. Thanks so much for being with us from the comfort of your living room in your pajamas, whatever you're wearing right now. We're so glad you're, glad that you're here. My name is Nolan, and I am the pastor here. And hey, I mentioned this already, but if you're either in person for the very first time or you're joining us online for the first time, man, thank you for being here. You know, we, we, we think it's such a special thing when God brings people to Motion Church to see what, what, what we're doing here. And we're, we're, we're a church that believes it's not just us for and no more, man. We want to reach as many people as possible for Jesus. I believe that a big church can make a big impact for Christ, and that's what it's all about. So we're so glad that all of you are with us today. And, and before I dive into this morning's message, I want to kind of throw a shameless pastor plug. I can do that because I got the mic. So we have a few motion groups that are taking place right now this fall. We have three different groups. Uh, one of them, uh, my wife uh, told me I can't go to. Apparently, I aged out of it's the young adults group. I'm like, babe, we're still young, young adults. And she's like, no, you're not a young adult anymore. So thanks for, thanks for raining on my parade, babe. But there's two that I'm eligible for. And I'm actually a part of these two different groups that we have for, for Motion Church. And I've just got to say this. One meets every week. One meets every other week. But personally, my relationships are being so much more strengthened and solidified as a result of these groups. Like weekend services, what we're doing right now is so important. It has its place. It's vital. But I believe that outside of Sunday, getting involved in relationship with other Christ followers that are like-minded, having conversations, being there for one another, having fun together, growing with each other, I mean, it's such a special and important.
important thing. God, God designed us for relationships. And so if you're here today and you're like, I need to get to meet some more people. I need some other Christ followers in my life. If that's you, after service, stop at guest services. Ask, what, what groups do you guys have to offer? We'd love to get you signed up. Don't do life alone. Well, as you probably saw from the bumper video, today I want us to talk about the, the elephant in the room or the donkey, depending upon, you know, which side, pun intended there. I want us to, to talk about the, the red and the blue, the, the elephant and the donkey, the Democrats, the Republicans. I want us to take a look at politics. And so I, I know that all of you know this, but if you're not living under a rock right now, you know that we are living in a very politically divided nation. I mean, based off of the tenor of last Tuesday's presidential debate, I was like, am I watching a UFC fight? Or what is this? Like, is Mike Tyson about to bite off Evander Holyfield's ear? You know, it was, it was very interesting. If you hop on social media, uh, you see the, the contentious conversations that are, that are taking place with people on either sides of the aisle. Turn on the news and you see like the political pundits and the commentators on both sides. And they're saying, if the other candidate wins, then basically it's the end of America as we know it. If the other candidate wins, not my person, then basically the whole world's gonna, gonna stop and I'm gonna move to Mexico or Canada, right? Like, that's, that's kind of the, the conversations that we're, we're hearing. So suffice it to say that we live in a very politically, uh, not very united nation at this time. And with this whole thought, this, this national conversation, it, it begs the, the question, what, what does this mean for us as followers of Christ? Where, where do we stand? What do we do? How do we, how do we respond? Because there are a lot of Republicans that are Christians. There are a lot of Democrats that are Christians. There will be a lot of Republicans in heaven. There will be a lot of Democrats in heaven. There, there are certain aspects of the Republican platform and party stance that align with biblical values. There are certain aspects of the Democratic platform and party that aligns with biblical values as well. And then you look at the Republicans and the Democrats, and there are some things that their platforms and their parties are, are, are all about that really, if we're being honest with ourselves and not being political, they, they look like Jesus not at all. Like, they look nothing like him at all. So we have this, this time, as followers of Christ, as Americans, where we're having to choose between two people. Where does that leave us as, as Christians? How do, we, how do we reconcile the differences? How should we respond to all the vitriol that we're seeing all around us? What do we do if our candidate doesn't win? I think it's important for us to have this conversation as a body of believers and just to discuss what, 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 what our place is as followers of Christ in a, in a politically contentious season like this. Now, I'm going to make a statement, and I think initially it might blow your mind a little bit, but I, but I believe it to be true, and I believe that Scripture backs this truth up, and it's the reality that Jesus was political. I, I believe this. Jesus was political, but probably not in the way that you and me are thinking. He, he approached this idea of, of authority and politics from a, a much different perspective than, than we do as, as Americans. However, Early on, when you look at Jesus' closest followers, well, when you look at the disciples, man, they, they had originally the, the same mindset when it came to politics that, that we tend to. They, they saw politics as, as this, who's the leader of my nation? What does that mean for me in the here, here and now? How, how can I get the person that I like, that I support, that's going to help me get what I want? How can I, how can I get them into political office? That's the way that... Jesus' original disciples viewed politics, and that's the way that we as Americans tend to as well. So to kind of set the, the stage here, when Jesus shows up on earth, he arrives in first century Jewish Palestine. And, and at this time in history, the Jews weren't like living in a free country where they were able to, to govern themselves, uh, vote on who they wanted, uh, find their own political party, and, and tax themselves. Um, no, at, at this point in history, the Jews, God's people, were living under Roman oppression. So the Romans had come in, they had conquered their territory, so, so they were now a province of the kingdom of Rome. So, so what does that mean? Who do they pay their taxes to? Rome. Who told them what to do? Rome told them what to do. 
If, if they kind of got out of line and they didn't follow the, the Roman things that they were expected to do, who would put them back into place? The Roman soldiers would. So, so think of it like this. Imagine here in America, if, if like Russia or, or China took over the U.S., not necessarily violently where, where everybody gets slaughtered. We have to change our ways and customs to fit theirs. But imagine where we're now under Chinese or, or Roman oppression here in the United States, where our freedom, our autonomy would be gone. Our taxes no longer go to make the U.S. better. It goes to make the overseas nation that's controlling us better. Like, I don't like paying taxes now. You know what I'm saying? But imagine paying taxes to a different nation that doesn't even benefit you. I'm going to be honest with you as a pastor. I'd cheat on my taxes if that happened right then. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't do it now as an American, but I do, I'd be doing some under-the-table shady deals if that happened in the, in the U.S. Thankfully, it's never going to. But that's what's, what's going on. Their taxes are going to them. They're, they're oppressed by them. The Roman soldiers are there with them. Imagine foreign soldiers walking through the streets of our nation. Imagine them telling us what to do, and if we don't do what they ask us to do, they have the ability to, to beat us or to throw us in prison. Rather than voting for a leader that we want, we're assigned a leader from this other nation that's there to keep us as Americans in line. That's, that's essentially what the Jews were experiencing politically. Well, for hundreds of years, they had been awaiting this promised Messiah. They had been waiting for this, this promised Savior, this, this king that was going to come to earth to set them free, to give them freedom, to make life so much better. They had been waiting this, for this for such a long time. So if you're a first century Jewish person, imagine what you would think when this new guy shows up on the scene named Jesus. Jesus shows up and he starts going different places and, and talking, almost seems like he's giving speeches. He's, he's talking about the Bible and, and what God wants to do on this earth. And as he begins to speak, more and more people start to show up. He, he's having big crowds follow him everywhere that he goes. And this Jesus guy starts gaining more clout and more clout and more clout. And then he starts talking about, in Mark 1 verse 15, how he's there to establish a new kingdom. That the time has come and the kingdom of God is near. If you're a, a first century Jew, you're thinking to yourself, this is the guy that I have been waiting for. This is the political figure that I've wanted on the ballot. This is the person. Finally, God sent us a leader for our nation and for our people. Finally, God sent us somebody that's going to help us stick it to the Romans. Jesus will be a great earthly king. Jesus will be a great powerful warrior king like King David was in the Bible. Yes, Jesus is here. Jesus is going to do great things for us here on earth. But this is where Jesus' politics differ from his early followers and from us today. we, we got to understand that Jesus wasn't here to establish an earthly kingdom Jesus wasn't a nationalist that was there to fight for the political leanings of certain people. No, Jesus was here and he came to establish God's kingdom on earth. And if I could just stop right here and make this point, I think it's so important for us to, to understand as believers and followers of Christ, it's this truth that God's kingdom is more important than any kingdom. Let me say that again. God's kingdom is more important than any kingdom or nation. And let me preface my thoughts here. I stinking love our country. I, I love the United States. I think we, we live in the best nation in the history of the world. Ha, are we perfect? Of course not. We're made up of humans, right? Of course, we're, we're never going to be perfect. But I believe that we live in such an amazing country. That's why people want to come to our nation. If I was born in a different country, I'd try to get to the U.S. because I believe our country is so, so good. But I can't get so focused on this nation and my comforts and what I want to happen that I put it over God and his will. And I, and I make politics more important than what God wants to accomplish here on earth. That I make politics more important than God's purpose and what he wants to accomplish in my life. I mean, when you think about it, that's the exact opposite of what the Pledge of Allegiance says. What does it say? Not one nation above God, not one nation telling God what to do. It's one nation under God. That's the proper place for America, for our politics to be. God's kingdom in our life has always got to be so much more important. 
But I know, at least for me, sometimes it's easy to, to worship and even kind of begin to deify our comforts, our, our desires, our political leaders. Why? Because those people, those things, they give us what we want. And if we're not careful, what happens is we begin to slide politics and priority over God's kingdom. And I would just say this, especially during election seasons. We can start talking more about politics than about Jesus. We can start posting on social media more about politics than we're posting about Jesus. We can start to treat people horribly if they don't agree with us politically when that looks like nothing like the kingdom of God and who God has called us to be. And I would just say this. You know, when you get to your deathbed, you're not going to be lying there about to pass away, pass away and say to one of your family members, hey, can, can you come over here and read me a few lines from the Bill of Rights? You're not going to do that, right? It, it doesn't matter. But what you might do is that as you're on your deathbed getting ready to, tra- to transition from this earth into heaven to this, this reality to the next thing that God has for you, eternity, you might say to one of your family members, hey, can you come read me some scriptures? Tell me about the promises of God to help me transition into what God has for me in this next world. God's kingdom, we've got to keep it in perspective, is is more important than any kingdom. And, And here's why I believe this is so important for us to keep in check. Because back when Jesus was here on earth, at first, he was welcomed. At first, people were like, he's the warrior king. He's going to give us what we want. He's going to politically align with us. He's going to push back Rome. And when they find out Jesus wasn't like this political person that they wanted and their politics didn't agree with him, what did they do? They just pushed him off to the side. And they they were more concerned with having this warrior king, a national leader, a person that sided with their politics. They were more concerned with all of that than having a spiritual savior. They were more concerned with politics than they were God. And because of that, they missed out on what Jesus had for them. We, we as, as, as Christians can never allow ourselves to get that way. But let's, let's look real quick to God's word on how we should view politics, politicians, and all that goes with it. It's, it's found in Psalms chapter 146, verse 1 through 10. Got some, some wisdom from scripture here. It's a little bit long, so stick with me. This is what it says, verse 1. It says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Verse three, do not put your trust, check this out, in princes and human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Verse five, blessed are those who help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, their God. Verse six, he is the maker of heaven and earth. The sea and everything in them, he remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. Verse 8, the Lord gives sight to the blind. And he, and he uh, sorry, excuse me. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. Verse 9, the Lord watches over the foreign and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Friends, this this passage that we just read, everything that was just there, that should be so comforting to us. That should throw fear or anxiety out the window regardless of what happens with the elections here or in the future. Remember, regardless of who's in office, we should remember our trust should be in God. Our hope is in him. He's the one that sustains us. Not a political party, not a person, not a figurehead. It's God that our trust should ultimately be. And so no matter what happens, we got to remember that. We've got to remember that God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. I think a good thing for us to remember is this. Regardless of who's sitting in the White House, God is still sitting on the throne. And I'll just say that again. Regardless of who's sitting in the White House, if November 3rd, your candidate, your preferred party doesn't win and your hair is on fire and you're thinking, I'm moving to Canada. If you think that, remember, regardless of who's sitting in the White House, God is still sitting on the throne. That's what's most important. And also just remember this, we're electing a president, not choosing a savior. 
We already have a Savior, and his name is Jesus, and he's reconciled all that really matters in this world, and he's all that we truly, actually do need. And in fact, check out with me what Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 through 21 says. So important for us to remember as American Christians. I can get this out of whack sometimes. Verse 20 says this, but our citizenship is in heaven. Let me read that part again. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await the Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. As American Christians, as followers of Jesus that live in the United States, whose citizenship is in the United United States, our, our first, our most important citizenship is in heaven. That's where our allegiance should lie first and foremost always. Not in American politics, not in this party or that party, not in this politician or that politician. Our most important allegiance lies with Christ. Our citizenship, we've got, we got to remember, is in heaven with God. And, and because of that, here's what I know. Regardless of who's elected, regardless of, of who's in office and leading, I'm good. You're, you're good. Regardless of, of who gets voted in, we, we don't have to worry because we all win in the end. If we're citizens, if we're, we're followers of Christ, if God's number one in our life, we're citizens of heaven. So, baby, you're good to go. There's nothing to stress about or worry about. And I just thought about that, this, this kind of crazy idea to me this week. It just came to me that I'm a part of the first family, right? You're, you're a part of the first family. I mean, you know, you have the, the, the first family here in the United States. You got like Don Jr. and Ivanka and Eric and Baron and the other daughter. I can't remember her name. And, and they're, they're, they're the first family. But when I think about it, because I'm a part of God's family, I'm a part of God's first family. And what's cool, you think about all of the perks that come with being in the first family of the United States. But think of all of the perks that come with being in God's family. Think of all the promises that you and I have from God because we're part of God's family. Man, they ain't got nothing on us. I don't care if they fly around in a 747. I'm a part of God's family. That's pretty stinking cool. That's all that, that really matters. So, so what does this mean for us today? What does it mean for us today? In this, in this election season, and really all the time, here's where our, our priorities should be. Number one, first, faith. Number two, politics. Let me say that again. Faith first, and then a, a distant second, then politics. When we face a contentious election season, it's easy to get these backwards. It's easy to focus more on politics than it is faith on what we want more than what God wants. It's easy to kind of get it twisted, but that's not the biblical way of doing things. Even Jesus, even Jesus had to deal with this, this idea of, of politics and, and God and God's kingdom versus the earthly kingdom. We, we see this in Mark chapter 12. So some of these religious Pharisees who, by the way, hated Jesus, they, they wanted to trip Jesus up into saying something wrong to get him in trouble with the Romans. And so they come up to Jesus, and they ask Jesus this question. Hey, Jesus, uh, you, you're a smart guy. You give us great answers. You're very wise. So we're, we're Jewish citizens. We follow God. So should we pay taxes to Caesar? If, if we're actually citizens of heaven, should we, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And this is what... So what Jesus says, you can't, you can't trick Jesus. He's, he's the creator of the world, right? He catches him. He says this in Mark chapter 12, verse 17. It's on the screen behind me. It says this. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And, and here's really what Jesus was saying in this moment. What the Roman government wants you to give them, do it. Those, those taxes belong to Caesar, so give them back that, that small portion, give it back to him, and then give to God what is God's. So I think for us that begs the question, well, what is God's? What, what does God, what belongs to him? And I would just say this, everything, everything belongs to God. Is there a place for politics, for government? Sure, of course there is. But that needs to be just a small portion of our life. That needs to be a small portion of our focus and our attention. Should we vote? Absolutely. 
People have sacrificed for our ability to go to the ballot box and to choose. We, of course we should. Here's how we should do it. We should look at both parties' platform, their, their opinions, that, that political leaders, from all the way from the local level all the way up, we should look at everything that they believe in. And what we should do is we should compare it with what God's word says. We should compare what they say with what God's word says. And what you do is you vote as close as you possibly can according to God's ways and according to God's values. That's the biblical, most biblical way I can explain to us how to vote. Try and get it as close to Jesus would be as possible. There's a place for politics, but everything else in our life, it needs to go to God. It needs to go to him. And friends, here's, here's what I truly believe you know, the, the more we allow ourselves to, to dive into, to delve into politics and, and really get obsessed with it, what, what does it do? It just ends up dividing us, right? It just ends up kind of putting more division between us and other people. But what happens is when we dive more into the kingdom of God, into his plans, into his purpose, what does it do? It does the opposite. It unites us together. The more we dive into God, the more we're united because we're first citizens of heaven and then we're American Republicans or American Democrats. And I would just say this, Jesus wants to come back for his unified church, not his divided political church. He wants to come back for a group of people that are in unity with one another. Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 says this, it says there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And I don't know about you, but even in the the big C church as a whole lately, I feel like so many people have begun to allow politics to divide. They kind of started to put politics before their faith and and politics and opinion in front of unity with their other brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen, God hasn't called us to call out people on the other side of the aisle for voting differently than us, for telling them that they're wrong for what they think. God hasn't called us to to get on social media and be a keyboard warrior when somebody says their opinion and who they're going to vote for. God, God hasn't called us to think that way, to live that way, to act that way. That's not who we're supposed to be as the body of Christ. You know, I would just say this. We live in the greatest nation in the history of the world. We do. We live in the greatest nation in history, but you know what? Reality, there's an expiration date on this nation. There's an expiration date on every nation in the world, but you know what? There's not an expiration date on God's kingdom. God's kingdom will last forever, and I'm thankful to be a a citizen of heaven first, and then next, an American citizen. I'm thankful that I'm, I'm found in heaven first, and then secondly, found here in the United States. So here, here's what I want us to do today. Today, I want us to kind of close out service a little bit differently than we normally do. You know, I, I spoke on the importance of, of unity as followers of Christ, of unity among believers, and, and I can't think of a, a better way to, to come together as one than to take communion together. And at this time, the ushers are gonna go around and pass out communion packets to everybody the bread and the juice. But here's what I believe communion does. It takes a bunch of people from all kinds of different backgrounds, takes a bunch of people from all kinds of different socioeconomic statuses, different political parties and affiliations, a bunch of people with all kinds of past that we're not proud of and we're, we're kind of embarrassed of the things that we do. And what it does is it puts us all united, not under a a political person, but under the cross of Christ. Puts us all under what Jesus did for us by sacrificing his life for us on the Christ, on the cross. So that we can be not just citizens of the U.S., but but of heaven first, because that's what's most important. And maybe today you're here, and as as I'm talking, you're like, man, I've kind of got this out of perspective. I I need to realign a a little bit, maybe getting some, some priorities back in order. I think, I think we do that by, by taking our eyes off of politics, off of politicians, and putting our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith, the ones that sustains us here on earth and will sustain us forever in heaven. So once you get your packet, that top layer, you can peel back 
It has the wafer there, the cracker, and then the next layer has your juice. And I want to make sure everybody has anybody missing? Awesome. This is what the Bible says about communion. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it says this. It says, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And we had, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You know, on, on the night that Jesus was about to be killed for our sin to be wiped out, the, the night before, Jesus had his closest friends, his closest disciples together, and he's getting ready to, to go to the cross, and he says, hey, I'm going I'm to be gone from here, but as often as you can, I want you to, to take this, this bread, which represents my body, which was broken for you. I want you to take this, this wine, this juice, and, and to drink it together to remember the blood that was shed so that your past can be wiped away. You can be a new person. Everything that you've done, clean slate, going to heaven, that, that's what Jesus' blood does for us. So, so do this together, and as you do it, remember me. And I believe that as you do it together, Jesus was saying it's going to bring you guys together in unity. And I believe that's important for us to do this together in a politically divided time to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of political affiliation, and to say our first allegiance is to Jesus. Jesus, thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for getting your back beaten, hung on the cross, humiliated so that I could have life, not just on earth here in this place, but in heaven for eternity. That's what it's all about. Can we take the bread together? And God, today I thank you for your body, which was broken for us. God, in the book of Isaiah says that by your stripes, we are healed. We're healed, healed, healed spiritually, we're healed emotionally, but we're healed physically. We, we thank you for the pain that you took on your physical body so that we can be healed. We thank you for that today. The Bible says this in, in verse 25, it says, in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And this, this cup represents the blood that was shed so that our sins could be separated as far away as the east is from the west. Let's take the cup together today. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you for your blood that was shed. God, you were innocent, you lived the perfect life, yet you chose to spill your blood so that we could be made right. God, we don't deserve it, we're not worthy of it, but today, individually, corporately, we thank you for it. Thank you for the price that you paid for us. Thank you that our citizenship is in heaven and we're gonna spend eternity with you forever. Thank you for that today. God, for your people, I pray that we would always get our priorities straight faith first, a distant second, later on, politics. Let us keep those priorities in order. God, let us be loving in politically contentious times. God, let us display the love of Christ. God, let us put our hope in you and not in a person. And God, I thank you that no matter who's in the White House, God, you are on the throne of our life, of this world, of this universe. That's all that really matters. So God, we put you at the right place in our life this morning. We love you. We thank you. God, be with your people this week as they go to their work, to school, to the places. God, let us be a light. Let us shine bright and shine your love to others. God, we thank you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. Can we give God a hand real quick? God's good. Well, guys, once again, we love you. Thanks so much for being here today. If today is your first time, stop by guest services, get your gift, come back next week, bring some people with you. You guys have a great one. We love you.